Okay, and we are live. Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to our Inner Own Voice for today is Tuesday, uh, October the 25th. Thank you all for coming. I see some people are coming in as we speak. We appreciate it. We'd like to start promptly at two when we can, or at five when we can here at Pacific time for NAMI Orange County. Um, we thank you all for taking the time to be here to listen to our inner own voice presentation and to also be a part of it. Um, my name is Ed Portillo. I'm a program coordinator here at NAMI Orange County and I have uh, been with NAMI for going on three years now and I'm an oh, assistant program manager now. Did I say program coordinator? I'm assistant program coordinator now, uh, assistant program manager now. And uh, what I do is a lot of in our own voice, which is one of my uh, favorite uh, things that we offer here at NAMI Orange County. So it's a treat for me to be here. And I'm going to go ahead and go into a little bit of uh, what we're doing here at in our own voice and also introduce our presenters. Uh, so hello, everyone. Welcome to NAMI Orange County's in our own voice presentation today with John Reynolds and Gina Gia Bianco. Oh, uh, Capo yeah, Bianco, yeah. Uh, I appreciate everyone being here. Um, the National Alliance on Mental Illness is a U.S.-based advocacy group originally founded as a grassroots organization by family members of people diagnosed with mental illness, and NAMI identifies its mission as being dedicated to building better lives for the millions of Americans affected by mental illness. What we're about to experience is NAMI in our own voice presentation. And the goal of this presentation is to change the attitudes, assumptions, and ideas about people with mental health conditions. These presentations provide a personal perspective of mental health conditions as leaders with lived experience talk openly about what it's like to have a mental health condition. They break up their story into sections, starting with their dark days, acceptance, treatment, coping skills, and successes, hopes, and dreams. And uh, if we have some time, we'll be taking some questions. And I uh, also wanted to welcome, so far we have about five people attending. I wanted to see from the people that are here, um, is, are everybody from Orange County? If, you, if you're in Orange County, can you raise your hand? I wanted to just to see if people from Orange County. Oh, great. Yeah, I see that Linda's here from Orange County. Great, great. Is anybody here from LA County? LA County is represented in the people that are here. Or, or maybe out of state, are you in California or maybe, okay, yeah, yeah, there's somebody from uh, LA County, which also is where Gina is at. Gina is in LA County, so it's nice that we can connect different counties here as we present our inner own voice presentation. Also, Austin Mestic, our program manager is here. Uh, he will be taking questions about inner own voice or anything NAMI related. So. Um, if you have a question about NAMI, uh, we do have a warm line, which is a 24-hour um, hotline and that Austin will be putting in the chat, as well as putting a survey on um, what your thoughts are on our presentations. We appreciate your feedback because that helps us continue offering our programs for free to the community. So with that, I am going to uh, pass it over to our presenters, and they will talk about their stories in segments. So speaker one will be John and then speaker two will be Gina. And John will go with his first part of his story and then pass it over to Gina and Gina will pass it back to John and so on. Um, they will also do their introductions. And so with that, I will pass on. Okay, great. Uh, thanks Edward for that. Gina, nice to meet you. And Austin, thanks for being here and welcome everybody to uh, Inner Own Voice. I live in Orange County, California. I'm 10, uh, about five miles away from Disneyland in a town called Santa Ana. I've been here since 1972 and I'm married. I have a stepdaughter and I got six brothers and sisters in my life that are still around and um, I take care of my mom. I have a full-time job during the week and a part-time job on the weekend. I'm a busy guy. Um, Anyways, I was born in London, raised in New Orleans, and moved to Santa Ana in 1972. And um, let's see, uh, my story's kind of an anomaly. I'll get into it in a minute. But uh, 
I'm just grateful to be here. I've spoken many, many times before, and each time is different. Um, I haven't done this forum too much, um, so it's unusual not to be able to see you guys, but uh, um, welcome anyways. So I met Gina for the first time today, and uh, we're both published author authors, if I can say that, Gina. Sure. We're, both, we're both published authors, and, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to reading some of Gina's material as she reads mine. And um, anyways, so I work, I work at a psychiatric hospital in the town of Santa Ana, been there three years. I've had different capacities and different health, mental health organizations over the last 15 years. And I've been in recovery a long time. And I'll get to that after uh, Gina introduces herself. Thank you, pass it on to you. Gina. Actually, John, you can go into your dark days and then and then pass it over to Gina and she'll do her introduction and go with her dark days. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I'm the fourth born of seven kids. I'm a twin. I was, I was born in London, like I said, raised in New Orleans. And then, uh, you know, my dark days were really bright because I have bipolar disorder to the manic side. So they, they call the, in the video, they call it dark days, but mine were really, really bright. But in a sense, they were dark in the sense that um, I was really ill. So I went through high school, public high school, started drinking when I was 15, uh, started smoking weed when I was 17, and I uh, got into college up in Los Angeles. I was an athlete. I was uh, on a, uh, I wasn't on a scholarship for college, but I played, I played sports at college and um, I had a good GPA to get in there. Uh, I continued to smoke weed and uh, drink and do cocaine my freshman year. And then uh, in uh, March of 1986, I was sex, uh, second semester of my sophomore year. I went into a full-blown mania. And I have what the, they call religious ideation, which means some people think they're religious figures, and I did too. Um, religious ideation stands for ideas about religion. Anyway, so I... Started feeling really, really good. My mind started racing. I was sleeping about two hours a day. And um, I was in Los Angeles, the city of angels. And uh, before I got hospitalized, I've sat on the Hollywood sign. And I was going to leave the great, great peace march across the United States. So that's before I got hospitalized. I've been on the Hollywood sign, the third O. And um, up in LA, that sign, this is Hollywood. Anyways, um, it's a big one. And uh, when I got hospitalized uh, with the religious ideation, uh, my roommate thought he, at the hospital, St. Joseph of Orange County, there were two Jesuses in the same room and I was one of them. So um, I thought I was the second coming of Jesus for a long time. So did my roommate, but we had a discussion. And since my name's John, I humbled myself to be John the Baptist. So I left the hospital on lithium and I uh, went off my lithium, and um, I did baptize a couple kids down at San South Orange County Beach, and then I got rehospitalized. This time, I was 51-50, I AWOLed, and I was put on a one-on-one -on -one in the hospital. So basically, oh, that didn't stop my drinking. I got out of the hospital for the last time to this day, but continued to smoke weed and drink for three more years. And um, it was pretty dark, I guess, um, smoking weed and drinking pretty much on top of lithium. Um, so those are my dark days. And uh, there's more to it than that. But that's all I can say right now. And um, I'm going to pass it over to Gina now. Thank you. Um, my, um, my name is Gina Capobianco. Um, I'm a teacher during the week. Um, I've been teaching for 25 years now. I teach special education. Um, in the last few years, I've gotten into mental health advocacy as a way of coping with my own mental health struggles. Um, so I, I do that on the side. I'm also, as John said, a writer. Um, I have four books out and a fifth one coming out in December, which I'll talk about later. Um, as far as my dark days, my dark days started as a teenager. Uh, I was about 14. And I don't really remember what started it. I just remember feeling really dark. 
I remember using the image of darkness and talking a lot about death. Um, I didn't understand what I was feeling and there was no way to get help in those days that, um, you know, I, I went to a Catholic high school and it was just not something that was talked about. And even though I was expressing suicidal ideation, um, very obsessed with not wanting to live, nothing was really done. They brought in a counselor. I didn't like the counselor, so I resisted talking to her. Um, I started drinking. Um, I think alcohol is is not all that uncommon in mental illness because some of us find it as a way to self-medicate. And I drank for several years, um, starting when I was about 15, basically became an alcoholic. Um, I didn't really get help until I was in college. It was the first time that I was was diagnosed with depression and anxiety. Um, and I've lived with it now for about 35 years. And the dark days come and go for me. Um, I'll be fine for a while or like I'll reach a baseline that's kind of functioning well and doing okay. And then I'll start to get down again. I'll get real depressed. Um, and it's hard to see, see positives in my life. Um, I'm actually, as I'm talking today, still in a kind of a dark period. Um, I'm back in treatment. Um, and I'll talk more about the treatment that I receive in a little while. But it's hard to live with a mental illness because sometimes you have to put on this facade that you're okay when in reality you're not when you have to put on a smile and go to work when inside your head there's all these thoughts about you know just negative thoughts like you'd be better off dead you'd be you know nothing ever goes right you just feel this sense of darkness and doom um and then for me the anxiety kicks in and then I start questioning everything, worrying about everything. I'll get physical symptoms like chest pain, um, fit, get, get fidgety. And so, you know, depression alone is hard to deal with. Anxiety alone is hard to deal with. When you've got them both going, it makes life really difficult. Um, so, you know, my dark days come and go, as I said, and it's a lifelong battle, um, but one that right now I'm willing to keep fighting because I have seen the light out there. Um, and I'll, that's my dark days. I'm gonna pass it back to John for acceptance. Thanks, Gina. I'm duly diagnosed co-occurring disorder with alcoholism and uh, bipolar disorder, mood disorder. And acceptance has come differently in both those different diseases, they call them. I have a disease of the mind, an obsession of the mind, which is alcoholism. And the mood disorder comes in uh, with a biochemical uh, variations in the brain. So I've accepted my alcoholism. It was actually when I drank with eight months of sobriety that uh, I realized uh, I had a drinking problem and I conceded to mind myself I was an alcoholic. That was August 31st, 1989. And uh, that's what it took for me to accept my alcoholism, to drink with Stone Cold Sober for, uh, I was ahead of a period of eight months underneath my belt. The bipolar disorder, because I was only under treated for so long with that salt I was telling you about, that, uh, it, 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 it completely uh, occupied my psyche that I was a religious figure. So today, acceptance would be the fact that I take my medication every day. I take a mood stabilizer and an antipsychotic. And every time I take those, I'm pretty much saying, yes, I do have bipolar disorder. But that's on a day-to-day -day thing. But as far as the substance use disorder that I have, it was definitely driven into me on that August 31st, 1989. And I'm happy to say that 
my sobriety date today is December 20th, 1989. It took me three months to get sober after that. So I've been sober over 32 years and um, I've had maybe three med changes in the last 36 years since I was hospitalized in 1986. Uh, so acceptance is a daily basis for my mental disorder, but I'm pretty much convinced I'm an alcoholic. So I've accepted that and I do whatever it takes to treat that, which will be in the next segment. Acceptance uh, is important to have, you know, or why take medicine or why stop drinking if you don't have, you know, you have a problem, you know, so very important to me. And uh, that's, that's acceptance for me. I'll pass it on to Gina. Thank you, John. Um, for me, acceptance was a long time in coming. Um, I, for me, I tried to hide my depression for a long time. Um, I tried to hide the anxiety, the depression, because I was embarrassed. And, you know, we talk about there being a stigma surrounding mental health, and it's true. Like, even today, I still hide it from my boss. There's, there's no way I want my boss to know that I have a mental illness because I don't want to be judged. Um, the first step in acceptance was when I quit drinking. Um, I accepted the alcoholism. Um, I've been, that was in, in 2002. So I've been sober. I just, this past May, it was 20 years. And it was a very hard thing to do because I was self-medicating with the alcohol. So when I accepted the alcoholism, the depression and anxiety got worse because I lost that numbing agent. The alcohol was numbing me um, and helping me cope ineffective, ineffectively with um, the depression and anxiety. It wasn't, it was another 10, 11 years before I can say that I started to accept my mental illness. I was in my forties. Um, before I started to accept it. Um, and I think for me, acceptance means being able to say I have a mental illness and it's okay. Um, I'm gonna have good days and bad days. I'm gonna have days where the depression is in control. I'm gonna have days where I'm in control. And I've, I've worked hard to teach myself that it's okay to have those bad days. Um, I've had a lot of help along the way. Um, I've been blessed. I've had the same psychologist for 20 years. Not only did he help me stop drinking, but he's been he's been there for me for 20 years. Um, even when I have dark days now, I just recently I called him and said, hey, I'm having those thoughts again. And he's there for me. Um, I know that if I'm having trouble between appointments, I can call him. Um, and that's been that's been key to my healing is both my psychologist and my current psychiatrist, they listen. And I think as someone with a mental illness, we often get overlooked because of that stigma, whether we're we're hiding our mental illness or we're being put down because of it, we don't get listened to and we don't tell our stories. And once I accepted it, I was able to start sharing my story. And that that helped me come a long way in my healing. And I I hope, I, I, I think it's helped others. Um, so I think that's, for me, that's the key of acceptance is to know that I it's okay to not be okay and to know it's okay to share my story. That what I went through has a purpose. And if that, if my story helps just one other person get through their mental illness or helps them understand a loved one's mental illness, then, then I'm better off. So I think acceptance is key, but I recognize how hard it is to reach that point. Um, so I'd like to turn it back over to John for treatment. Thanks, Gina. Uh, that's two segments down, three to go. 
Uh, if you guys have any questions, you can um, chat with uh, Edward or Austin. Uh, Edward would be better. He's um, on it right now. Um, I get what Gina was saying about acceptance uh, because the, the disorders in our brain, it's hard to wrap our heads around, at least for me, wrap around the fact that I'm bipolar, have a mood disorder when I was sick so long. Um, but now I can see it clearly, but, you know, like Gina was saying, like, we're both published, we're both brilliant people. She's a teacher. I'm a counselor. Um, Abraham Lincoln was a depressive and, you know, uh, we're some really intelligent people. Um, there's no doubt about that, but, um, anyways, but, uh, treatment, now, I have one more story to share. I got off the alcohol. I went to, okay, I have, I've had a same psychologist kind of like Gina did. I had him for about 27 years. He was the night counselor at St. Joe's when I was in rehab. St. Joseph of Orange, the Sisters of St. Joseph in Orange, California. I went to their uh, Sister Elizabeth building for partial uh, rehab because I was partially alcoholic at the time. It's like being half pregnant. I didn't know I was an alcoholic till eight months later, but I've been in AA for over 32 years now. But um, when I got off the weed on December 23rd, 1988, I went into a mania in that period of uh, sobriety where I was uh, in a recovery home and I went, it was manic and I got on the roof and thought I was the carpenter and replay would the whole house. And I got kicked, uh, I got down off the roof and the manager kicked me out of the house. So I went to my third day at Disneyland and they escorted me in my third day of work at Disneyland. And um, they asked me who I was. And I said, I'm John the Baptist and a drug addict. And they um, escorted me into security, said I could never, never no longer work there again. I lied, I lied on my application. That was with a college degree. I was in cash control. I'm sure Disneyland regrets that. But anyways, uh, treatment for me is simple. Like Gina, I had seen a therapist, a psychologist for about 30 years. And I see one right now for uh, continued uh, help. I take medicine. I, uh, I have a, a spiritual life, which is very rich. Um, I have a higher power that I believe in, that I lean on a lot. I have the fellowship of uh, the 12-step program. Um, and I have a good psychiatrist. I work. 40 hours a week. I take care of my family. I take care of my mom. I'm, I'm kind of a busy guy, but that all that helps me stay sober and, um, um, and I'm sane, I guess you'd say. So medicine, therapy, psychiatry, sobriety, sponsor, 12 steps, working a full-time job and um, taking care of myself are all ways that I treat my dual diagnosis. Uh, I think that's about it on that one. Uh, Gina, go ahead on uh, accept or uh, treatment. Thank you. Um, for me, I went the first five years without treatment because I didn't have a diagnosis until I got to college. And then that started, um, I started going to therapy and was put on medication for the first time. And I would remain on medication I've been on medication since then. So to this day, I'm on medication. Um, I've been through a few psychiatrists during that time. One of those psychiatrists I was with for about 10 years. And unfortunately, she was over medicating me. So I wasn't getting the treatment that I should have been getting. And it was actually a primary care provider, um, a, a physician's assistant, not even a doctor, who discovered that I was being over-medicated and was actually addicted to one of my anxiety medications. It was at that point that I realized I needed to change psychiatrists, which was very difficult for me because I felt like, oh, I can't tell her, I, I can't go away from her. She's the doctor, she knows. And my, the physician's assistant told me, yes, you can break away. You need, a, you need a psychiatrist who's going to listen to you, who's going to medicate you the right way, 
the one I was seeing was like every time I went in was here's a here's a new new pill. Let's change this pill to this. Let's increase this dose. Let's change this. And I I got to be like a walking medicine cabinet. And um, the physician's assistant helped me get off of some of those medications and helped me find a new psychiatrist. And I had to go through a couple of psychiatrists before I found the one that I'm with now who who I credit with with really making a difference in my healing. Um, she kept me on a low number of medications and then she really listened to me. I had had a psychiatrist before who, who wanted me to do ECT and I was not at a point in my life where I wanted to try ECT. It, some of the side effects made me uncomfortable. And my psychiatrist listened and she didn't push it. And then we started looking for other options. We looked at ketamine, we looked at TMS and we finally said, let's try TMS, which is transcranial magnetic stimulation. And it's a alternative treatment for depression and anxiety. Um, it's usually used with people for whom medication hasn't worked. And I had tried every medication and things just weren't working. So we took a chance on TMS and um, it worked for me. Um, I've gone through the treatment a few times and I'm actually currently in my third week of this new round of treatment. Um, it's the only thing we've found that that helps my depression that can bring me out of the, the darkness. Um, I'm, I'm so grateful to have found it. Um, it's, it's a commitment. I have to go every, every day. It takes about 45 minutes. Um, and I go five days a week for basically for two months, but the difference in how I feel and being able to wake up and not be surrounded by darkness has just been huge for me. Um, you know, I'm grateful to the staff at the TMS center that I go to, especially the psychiatric nurse practitioner who oversees my treatment. She listens, she explains everything. She gets it when I go in and I'm, I'm nervous because I'm like, what if it doesn't work this time? And it's just that sense of reassurance I get when I'm there. And the fact that the treatment does work has just made a huge difference for me. I know it's something that I'm gonna have to go back to periodically throughout my life, but that's part of the acceptance of having an illness. Someone who's diabetic has to take insulin. As someone with a mental illness, I have to take care of myself and receive the treatment that works for me. And I found that TMS for me is that treatment. It's not for everyone. Um, it's something that you have to work with your care team with and come to a decision about what you want to try, but it's made a huge difference in my life. And I, I don't think I'd be functioning as well as I am if I hadn't found TMS. Um, I think I would have been taken out of work couple of years ago and wouldn't be working right now because that's how bad the depression gets at times. And TMS has allowed me to, to keep living. So that's my, um, my treatment story. I'll hand it back over to John for coping skills. Thanks, Sheena. I'm so glad TMS is working for you. I haven't known too many people or anybody really just tried TMS, but I'm sure glad uh, that it's working for you. Um, a lot of my coping skills are similar to my treatment, how I treat my disorders, uh, work. Uh, idle time's a devil's time for me, so I got to stay occupied. I got to I gotta have a full-time job, I think. If there's anything, number one, and people that recover, stay sober for a long time, is that they have a job. You know, like sitting around watching I Love Lucy or, you know, like, uh, I don't know, 
like not having a job isn't really conducive to good sobriety or a decent life. So, I mean, not a decent life. I shouldn't say that. It helped me with my recovery. I'm sorry. I just, I, I, I don't know what I'd do if I wasn't working. So I'm glad we're both working. And um, I, I just want to share a story that uh, I've had, I'm on my fifth psychiatrist in 36 years. I left the first one because I was under medicated. And uh, the second one, her name was Elizabeth. She moved to Florida. The third one was Zachariah, who retired. And the parents of John the Baptist's names are Elizabeth and Zachariah. So, um, you know, there's definitely a theme in my life leaning towards spirituality and my uh, spiritual identity, which I really haven't quite figured out yet. But um, I just march one day at a time and keep my feet on the ground, keep marching, and um, God knows what's going to happen, you know. It's already happening. I'm touching people's lives like Gina is, you know, special people. Uh, so treatment would be uh, working a lot, uh, reading a lot of books. i got a whole library of theological books I read. And at one point, I couldn't read theology or the Bible because it would make my symptoms worse. Um, I used to think I was a Bible figure, a biblical figure, but uh, I guess that's not true, but my name is John, but it is 2022. It's not 2000 years ago and I'm not on the Jordan right now. So um, probably not that guy. I don't know. Anyways, treatment would be, or uh, coping skills or um, going to work playing tennis, taking medicine, taking care of my wife, taking care of my daughter, and uh, staying uh, fit, playing tennis a couple times a week, hanging out with healthy people. And um, that's about it on that. Uh, that's just a funny story about the second and third psychiatrists that they're Elizabeth and Zachariah, but it's all fun. I'm lucky, I'm blessed, just like, uh, like Gina is too. Um, so I'll let her talk about her coping skills. Thank you. Um, for me, I have a few coping skills. I think the most powerful coping skill is one that I stumbled on as a teenager before I was diagnosed. And that is writing. Um, I don't remember how it started but I started writing poetry as a teenager. And I believe that in some ways that was therapy for me before I had a therapist. It was letting me get the thoughts out and that were poisoning my mind. And I write to this day, I've been writing for 35 years and I tend to write more when things get bad. Um, it, it helps me get what's going on in my mind out and i like to write with a pen and paper because i i can feel then the depression the darkness coming out of my mind down my arm and out my hand into the pen so for me just writing is a huge coping skill and it's it's led me into mental health advocacy and has been just a healing tool for me other coping skills that I use, um, music helps me a lot to calm down when I'm really upset. Um, sometimes my friends will remind me, hey, go listen to some music. And you'd think that it would be calming music, like something instrumental or classical. But for me, it's rock music, um, particularly classic rock. I will put the band sticks on and blast it. And that helps me settle myself down. Um, I also just want to share kind of a quick story. Um, there's a band from the 60s. Um, I don't know if anyone here knows Jefferson Airplane. Um, I was a big Jefferson Airplane fan when I was a teenager. And their, one of their singers, the, the iconic Grace Slick, um, had a solo album that had a song on it called Let It Go. And I had that album and I would, at night as a teenager, I would be drinking and I would get the suicidal ideation. 
and I would start thinking it was time I was going to take my life and I would have a knife but I would be playing that album and I would play that song and more than once that song kept me from taking my life um I don't know what it was but I just I could feel Grace Slick singing to me and talking to me and telling me to let it go so music for me has been a huge coping skill. It, it literally saved my life. And I was lucky enough um, in 2019, Grace Slick had a um, art show in Hollywood and I was able to get tickets. And there was a line of people to talk to her and I got to get in that line and talk to her and tell her thank you. Um, and she looked at me when I told her she saved my life and she's like, no, you saved your own life. You were strong. And that just, it meant so much to me. Um, and then this past summer, I connected with her daughter and I was able to tell her daughter the story of how her mother saved my life. And that was just so powerful for me to be able to acknowledge someone who had that much of a role in how I learned to cope. And so now I'll still play that song. It's on my playlist on my phone and um, it helps me. So music is really healing for me. I also will try things like walking, um, done a little bit of painting. I'm not very good, but I like to do it. Um, so those are really my coping skills, the writing, listening to music, a little bit of walking and painting. So I'll hand it back to John for successes, hopes, and dreams. Thanks, Gina. Um, I'm a leadhead myself. Ah. Uh, and if I... I could point my camera around. I got a Jim Morrison's one of my idols too. And I have a picture with the Dalai Lama. Then I have Salvador Dali prints on my wall too. But anyways, so I, someone said, hello, Dali. <laughs> I got the Dalai Lama. I got the Dal Salvador Dali prints and Jim Morrison on my wall. I'm covering many bases right there. Anyways, uh, well, successes would be to stay sober this long out of the hospital 36 years um my hopes are that the clients or residents i interact with can um pull up their bootstraps and move on just like i did but it's really up to them and their higher power but um it's totally doable and um my dreams are maybe to write some more books and, um, you know, just uh, live a good life and um, stay sober and um, take it one day at a time. So uh, I want to thank you and I'll pass it back over to Gina. Hey, thank you. Um, for me, success comes with, with acceptance, just being able to accept that I have a mental illness that has been a success for me. Um, treating, getting treatment for my mental health is another success because I think there's so many people who don't get treatment um, that we have to count ourselves lucky and successful when we do get treatment. As far as hopes, um, you know, I, I hope to stay on top of my mental illness, to continue to be able to care for myself and to get the treatment I need, the support I need. And a big area of hope for me is to be able to use my story to help others. Um, I made a decision a few years ago that I wasn't going to be quiet anymore, that I had to use my voice because um, for so long I didn't have a voice. And so I hope that I can use my story of mental illness to help others and for me, that's come through writing books. I have my first four books are poetry books about mental illness, where I write basically what it's like to live with a mental illness. Um, and I've had the opportunity, and this is also a success, you know, just publishing those books and being able to speak about mental health um, has been a success for me. I think one of my hopes is to be able to continue working for organizations like NAMI and you know, I'm like, I'm grateful that I have this opportunity and that NAMI gives me this opportunity to speak because 
it allows that hope to become real. And for me to help to help others, I, I just hope that my message is heard. Um, my dream is to keep doing it. Um, I'd like to keep writing. I have a book coming out on December 5th. That's it's a memoir. Um, my dream is that that book will be successful. I've I'm taking more risks with it. I've actually reached out to some some people that I hope can help get that book more recognized. Um, I also want to work with the medical profession. I want to work with healthcare professionals because I've felt the stigma in healthcare, um, not just in the workplace, but in like, I had a, a primary care, a different one from the one I was talking about earlier, who was very hurtful in the way she let stigma lead her treatment of me. And when that happened, I was very hurt. And I don't wanna see that happen to other people. So my hope is that I can speak to groups of medical professionals and share my story so that they see that mental illness is a, a health issue. It It is an illness. There, You can't have total health without mental and physical health. So that's one of my dreams is to be able to stand in front of a room of doctors and nurses, physicians, assistants, uh, and share my story and have them take that back into their practice. Um, and, you know, my hope is that the stigma, my dream is that one day we're not going to have that stigma, that we're not going to have to have, you know, NAMI walk every year raising money to end the stigma. That help will already be there coming from the government. It'll come from people. It'll be, mental illness will be accepted for what it really is, an illness. And if I can be a small part of that, that's that'll be a dream come true. Um, so that's that's basically my story. Um, I'll turn it back over to Ed, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. That is um, so special to hear your story and to hear, John, your, your story as well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put the uh, OC warm line is uh, in the chat. I also put a link to the Grace Slick um, song that has lyrics. So if you're interested in that, to hear that. Um, but uh, we do have a time for questions. So if there is any questions that you'd like, you can fill the uh, Q&A button and send us a question. You can also put that in the chat or even raise your hand if you wanted to unmute yourself. We can unmute you to talk directly to um, our guests. Uh, this is um, really a special time that NAMI offers to, pro to provide individuals telling their story. Um, every day is not easy. Uh, every day isn't isn't always going to be a success, but um, there is reasons to hope. One of the things that NAMI, um, I learned at the conference, we just had our NAMI California conference, and one of the things that they were saying that they tell their uh, people that call the um, warm line is that you won't find the answers today. You won't get all the answers right now, and it is a process. And that's just, there's something about that, of knowing that you will eventually get better or there is a reason to hope or things can come together, um, it, it gives me a lot of solace and gives me a lot of uh, um, encouragement. Uh, yes, yeah, so Wendy says, will we get this recording? Yes, so we will put this on our YouTube page. Um, thankfully, John and, and Jean are, are okay for us to put this up. So we will put this up um, soon. So you can be able to see this. And we also have a uh, in our voice library really of different um, talks that we've done throughout the uh, two years or three years since 2020 really is when we started doing all of our stuff on on zoom. Um, I'm also going to put into the chat uh, our link to the walk. Thank you for mentioning that uh, Gina that we do have our walk coming up on the 19th of November. So uh, we'd love to see you there if you are in the Orange County area. It's our biggest fundraising opportunity, but it's also a great time to build community um, together uh, to, to push back against the stigma on um, mental illness. So we appreciate that. Well, uh, yeah, if there's any questions, we, we'd love to hear that. But in the, in the meantime, we do have a couple more minutes here. I wonder, Gina, if you can, oh, wait, here we go. Um, Yes, absolutely. Uh, let me let me see if Gina, if you wouldn't mind maybe reading 
one or two of the poems that from your um, some of your books. We'd love to hear it. Sure. Um... I'll start with one that's um, this one's kind of dark. So I'll read one that's dark and then I'll read one that's more positive. This one's called Darkness Reemerges. I struggle to understand what is happening. Everything was going so well, but now I am tumbling. My life is a mess again. I cannot sleep. Simple acts take up most of my energy. I am surrounded by a fog. My focus is obscured. I do not want to do anything. I have no motivation. Lack the desire to be a part of anything. Spinning. My world is spinning. Darkness rushes in once again. I have so much to be happy about, but I cannot enjoy it. What is wrong with me? Why can I not just snap out of it? My mood drags me down. Lack of sleep paralyzes me. I do not want to succumb to the darkness, but fear I will. I have fought for so long. The light briefly shined. I felt so much better, but then the darkness reemerged delivered its crushing blow. I have fallen again. I wonder if I can ever get up. I do not understand the waves of depression. Will they ever remain just a ripple? Will I ever be strong enough to surf these waves? I thought I was doing so well. Now I am faced with the reality that the darkness will never fade. Darkness is always lurking always haunting me. I cannot escape the depression that grips my life. Um, I will read one that's more positive. Um, okay, this one's called My Journey. I have learned to trust my journey. It has been a hard and arduous journey but I have continued onward. Long bouts of darkness have clouded my life, dragged me to the depths I dare not describe. Days seemed like nights, my life blurring into one long day. Specks of light have glimmered throughout my journey, many only pausing as they passed. A few lights have guided my travels, remain by my side. My journey has a purpose. I travel through life for a reason. Hope flickers in the distance, drawing me ever closer. I know darkness will attempt to follow me, always be nearby, but now I see a destination. Grab onto the hope that beckons me. I allow myself to continue on this journey, though I take on a new role. The journey no longer controls me. I have become my own guide. As I continue forth, the light begins to shine more often, breaking through the dark clouds. My journey will continue, as now I look forward with a smile, ready to embrace the light that guides me. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, and it's the words stay with you. The journey will not determine my future. Your journey will not. Um, I, I love that. I, I love um, a lot of what you said and, and the other poems that I've, I've heard before. I really, really enjoy them. So um, we, we really appreciate everyone coming. Um, we appreciate everyone. Yes, I see Austin just put that uh, survey in the chat. If you would mind sending a uh, reply to that and putting your feedback on um, this in our voice presentation, you'll also be getting an email with that as well. So everyone that wasn't able to attend will be able to get that email. And also they'll get a um, link to the uh, recording on Zoom. We'll be able to send that out as well. Uh, but again, we really appreciate John and Gina for their time. Uh, we will be back next month and we're going to do an in our own voice presentation, but in Spanish. So we will have 
our, our November in our voice in Spanish, and then we'll do one in English in December as well. So we look forward to seeing you there. And um, again, if you have any questions about NAMI Orange County, uh, you can go to our website at namioc.org and you can check out our classes. You can check out our forums. You can check out our mentoring programs. Everything is free to the public. So feel free to check that out and at namioc.org. And again, my name is Ed Portillo, Assistant Program Manager with NAMI Orange County. And thanks everybody for attending.